Okay, my wife and I own Swan's Honey. Uh, we're the largest beekeeping operation and packing business in the state of Maine. We run somewhere around 2,000 colonies of bees, and we do, we have a uh, beekeeping supply store. We work with uh, part-time beekeepers. Um, I won't call them hobbyists, because I know that's sore, sore term sometimes with some folks. But uh, the, uh, we uh, sell a lot of nukes. We make up about 500 nukes a year for sale. And then uh, we do a lot of pollination. And uh, we pack a couple hundred thousand pounds of honey a year up in Maine. So we stay pretty busy with the bee operation. We also have run about, have about 150 acres of wild blueberries up there. And uh, so we do blueberries during the summertime also. Okay, uh, I'll give you a little bit of background on myself. Uh, I graduated back in 1981 from the University of Maine in chemical engineering. And I went to work down in uh, the Gulf of Mexico. Anyways, I uh, started off working in the Gulf of Mexico and I worked a couple of years down there commuting to uh, offshore platforms and by helicopter. And then the company moved me up to Alaska, and after a couple of years up there, I was running a, a, a drilling rig up in the Arctic. And, uh, and after, oh, about eight years in Alaska, I was uh, engineering manager at Prudhoe Bay. And the company decided that I needed to get some finance in my background and told me to uh, see if I could get into a good school and get a master's in finance. So I said goodbye to all my friends up there. And uh, I went down here in your backyard. I went down to Penn and went to Wharton and got a, a master's in finance. And the company moved me out to Los Angeles. And I worked out there and I was managed the cash flow for Atlantic Richfield. And, uh, and then all of a sudden along came this movie. And I decided to do something more challenging with my life. And, uh, Actually, that was the expression on my wife's face when uh, I told her I was going to become a beekeeper. Uh, also, the expression on my mother-in-law's face, my father-in-law's face, and quite a number of other people. But uh, anyways, uh, no, it's, it's pretty neat being a beekeeper. And uh, the, uh, you know, everybody, I mean, the oil industry, uh, nobody cares about that. But boy, you tell them you're a beekeeper, boy, everybody wants to know all about bees. The, uh, and uh, I'll share a little story with you. I was on a plane going down to uh, Jacksonville. Our winter operation is, is uh, down in South Georgia. So I fly into Jacksonville. And I got, was on this plane, and I was sitting next to this fellow, and boy, he was a strapping young guy, and I thought, boy, he could lift a lot of supers. <laughs> and, uh, the, uh, and he looked over at me, and I was reading a book on queen breeding. He says, he says does that say queen breeding? He says, they got books on that? <laughs> and I, and I, I said, well, this is, this is honeybees. He goes, oh, this is. So he had a million questions about beekeeping. And, this, and you know, I bet he asked me questions for an hour straight. And finally, I thought, well, I wonder what this fella does. And so I asked him. And he, it turns out he was a safety for the ja Jacksonville Jaguars. And so he's and he just signed a $5 million contract. So I told him it was a little more lucrative than beekeeping. But, uh, the, uh, but he said that he would much rather get hit by a 350-pound linebacker than, than, uh, than mess with a bunch of bees. And uh, so we went to pick up our luggage. And I thought, oh, this is pretty neat. I met an NFL player and everything. I'll have to tell my wife, but you know, I don't want to act too nerdy there. Get, picking up my luggage, just call her up. Well, here we are picking up our luggage. He's on his cell phone. And he says, honey, guess what? I met a beekeeper. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, th that uh, shows you you're in good company. The, uh, but the, uh, anyways, uh, I'm going to kind of go through our year and how it goes, and then I'll talk about some specifics about beekeeping, and then I'll open up to, um, to questions. Uh, we've got, I've got a number of different kinds of innovations that we've done in our operation. Uh, some of these things have been adopted even nationwide, uh, some of the things we're doing for wintering. Uh, you'll see 
as once Honey mentioned in the Brushy Mountain and, and Man Lakes catalog on some of the, the products that we've, we've come up with. Uh, in the fall, uh, we actually leave our bees in Maine right through Thanksgiving or the first of December. We want them to go into a, a kind of a, a winter cluster uh, where we can get a good treatment on the bees. And also, it's to kind of fool them a little bit, and I'll explain that in a minute. But uh, the, uh, here you can see this honeybee right here gathering pitch off a pine tree. Okay, obviously they make a lot of propolis, to plug up any, any cracks or anything in the hives, up, especially up in Maine in the, in the fall. Uh, we've got bees that stretch all the way from you know, mid-central Maine all the way up to the northernmost tip of Maine, uh, up in what they call a county. Uh, a lot of there's a lot of agriculture up there, a lot of um, uh, potato farms, but they actually will lay a lot of the potato fields fallow and will and they'll put in a lot of clover, and so it's it's pretty good forage. And then there's a lot of fields that are no longer being farmed where there's a lot of goldenrod, and uh, usually we have an excellent um, build up. It, it, it depend depending on the weather will determine whether or not we make a very good honey crop, but they usually always make enough honey to, put, to build a really good winter population of bees and also put away plenty of stores for themselves for the winter. Because even though we go to Georgia with the bees, they still, we still like to have a full deep of, of honey on the, on the hive. Because when they get down there, there's, there's nothing until spring gets started down there. So they've got a couple of months of brooding up and, and consuming honey. Okay, uh, this is our bee camp. You can see we live in, we have pretty uh, remarkable accommodations. Um, the, uh, you, you, you don't get rich being a beekeeper. Um, and hopefully you can find people working for you that don't mind living like this too. So, uh, in fact, this is the, the fellow that works, works with me. His, it's his, his camp up in Aroostook County. And uh, we try to get out of there before we get too much of those white stuff because it can be awfully hard to get your bees out of there. And about mid middle of November, we need to move them out of Aroostook County where we have till late November down in central Maine. Uh, we'll, we put candy on all of the hives up there before we ship them. Uh, it kind of gives a little insurance policy because we don't have a lot of time to mess around going around and lifting up individual hive bodies and making sure that they've got enough feed for winter and so forth, what we'll usually do is just put a slab of candy on everything and then we'll worry about which ones really need to be fed when they get down to Georgia. And uh, we find they do really well on, on this candy. Uh, we, we make it up, it's mostly sucrose, there's some high fructose corn syrup in it and we use a pollen uh, substitute as part of it also. And uh, and usually they'll have quite a bit of this candy left when they get to Georgia and they'll utilize that pollen substitute to get some brood rearing going. They have a lot of pollen that they've also uh, you know, obviously encapsulated in the honey in the fall and they're utilizing that too. Okay, after uh, the uh, in addition to the candy, uh, if there are no SEMA, spore counts are high, we'll actually f uh, feed fumigillin. And we do that uh, through kind of the way they uh, suggest doing it in Spain. And we've had very good success with this. Uh, instead of feeding two gallons of medicated syrup, like the label says, um, what we end up, sometimes we'll have problems with that with a large operation because you'll try to figure out, well, who's taking in their two gallons? And if one, one hive's taking in the gallon without a problem, you'll go back to the bee yard and another, another hive right next to it's only taken in half of it. Or another one hasn't taken in hardly any because it's plugged out with honey. Okay, a lot of you probably had those same kind of problems. Uh, what we find is that if you use the same amount of medication in a quart of, of syrup and put it in a Ziploc bag and put it on, the, on your top bars and just make a little razor slit in it, within three days it'll be gone, regardless of the hive. And uh, so then what we'll do is we'll go around one week, put a bag, bag on, go around the next week and put the second bag on. And I, I'd say 98% of them will, will take that in. It'll be gone, no mess, er, every, everything. And it works very well. 
I know there are about 70,000 colonies of bees come into the state of Maine each year for pollination. And I know that in the last two years, our NOSEMA counts are the lowest of all commercial operations. And in fact, we didn't even, uh, we didn't even uh, treat this fall because our NOSEMA counts are so low. Uh, but we, we do keep track of that. Uh, for, for bees wintering in Maine, we pretty much recommend to people that they do treat. Um, because you know the spore counts are going to increase over the course of the winter and e even though they might be relatively low going into winter they can get higher and, and compromise the ability of, of your bees to overwinter and, and build up well. So usually most of our uh, hobbyists actually will, uh, will, will treat regardless. Where we're going down to Georgia, we actually look at spore counts and, des and decide whether or not we do need to treat or not. But the ones that we winter up in Maine, we do treat those. Okay, um, we then take, load up all our bees, uh, we strap them, they're all on pallets. Uh, most of our operation are, are four hives to the pallet, our full size hives. And we, we ship them to Georgia, and uh, we gather them up first. This is up in Aroostook County in the fall. And he, here's our deluxe accommodations in Georgia. Uh, the, the, uh, this is my, uh, my mansion right here. This is, a, it's a, and uh, I actually have upgraded this year. I have an eight by 16 foot uh, cabin. You know, with a large screen TV, so I'm, uh, my, my father sent me the TV. He thought that would be kind of funny if the TV was as big as my cabin, and it is. And, uh, so uh, anyways, this, uh, this is kind of our cook shack. We actually have like a, a, a shower, uh, a little cabin with a shower and bathroom in it now, uh, which is better than where, the way we started. Um, and uh, some of the guys have campers and so forth that are down there. We actually have a couple of containers with a large tent over the top and uh, we have an outdoor uh, wood shop set up in there for doing things. And it actually works pretty good. That's, it's like a 50, 50 foot by 60 foot uh, uh, tarp. Or, it's not just a tarp, it's kind of one of these ag, ag things that goes right over the top. It's, like, uh, it's, it's actually done very well for us. We've had it there for a few years now. And we store all of our equipment and everything in the, two, in the two containers on the two sides. And we have table saw and raid alarm saw, drill press, and so forth. So we can, we can do a lot of work down there. Uh, our uh, bees are actually out. This, oh, there's our, uh, our kitchen. Um, uh, the bees are actually out on paper company land. We lease 40,000 acres of paper company land down there from Rainier. And about every three miles, there's a bee yard. So we'll, we can put between two and 3,000 colonies of bees down there in the fall. And uh, it's actually very convenient. Uh, we can leave our camp um, where we're staying and uh, within minutes be in the first bee yard. And we can actually work all our bees without seeing or bothering anybody else. Um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's extremely convenient. There's a ro network of roads going through all of the paper company land. Everything's pretty much farmed down there. It's different different type of forest than we're used to up in Maine. Um, you know, it's pretty much farmed pine trees, but then there's a lot of areas that they can't farm, which are very swampy. And uh, the understory of the pine trees has a lot of gallberry and palmetto. And the, in the wetter areas, there's a lot of tie tie. And I'll show you that in a minute here. Uh, we actually, when they get there, we'll put out a dry pollen substitute. And it's amazing how the bees will go for this stuff. Um, when, when, the, when they get down there, uh, uh, they are sensing that there's two hours of increased daylight from up in Maine and they think they've missed the shortest day of the year. So where your hives are building up after December 20th and into January, they're starting to build up for the coming spring, our bees think they've missed that December 20th somehow. They get to Georgia, and all of a sudden there's two hours more daylight, and they go, wow, we gotta get moving, okay? And what we find is by the end of January, our hives will be twice the size of any Georgia beekeepers hives. 
when they get to Georgia, ours will be maybe half the size of a Georgia hive. But by the end of January, ours will be double what theirs are because theirs are kind of on a, a, a slow slide and then kind of a slow slide to, to December 20th and then kind of a slow build up from that point where ours are just like boom, just like a, a hive uh, building up uh, in the springtime in the, in the northeast. So most of all of our hives right now have 50,000 bees in them uh, right today. And uh, so it's, uh, it's, it gives you a, a lot of population to work with when you're making nukes and things like that. Uh, it also gives you the opportunity to watch lots of bees fly in the air and swarm to trees. Um, we have different ways if we have to do emergency feeding. Uh, this is just sugar. Uh, one thing that's kind of handy that we have in doing a lot of these things like the fumigillin, uh, the candy, or um, feeding, uh, putting a pollen patty on or a formic pad or anything like that. Uh, we actually have like a, a fat cover. Uh, this is a migratory cover and we've actually gone to a composite uh, material. It's like decking material around the outside edge and then this is a, the, the top is a cement form board. Uh, that's cement form boards pretty commonly used down south because everything rots so quickly. Uh, but we, this combination, and then we have pressure treated wood on the two ends, and this, this combination has worked really well. Uh, th this cover is several years old, and a regular wooden cover only lasts about five years down in, in Georgia, even, no matter how good the paint is. So th this, this cover has worked well. It gives us that extra inch and a half space in there. Uh, we kind of adapted the same um, same thing when we were doing our uh, for the hobbyists up in up in Maine. This is a um, an inner cover. Uh, I see Brushy Mountain even has a, has some copies of it back there. Um, and this is what Man Lake's selling this now also. And this is our wintering inner cover. And it it just gives you that extra shim that you can use, um, or you can put can pour candy into this and put it right over your hives in the winter time. You can uh, put it right side up and then a feed jar will fit right in the hole in the middle. And, uh, and we actually use it for, for wintering purposes so that we can just pop this up and stick a slab of candy in there in, in the winter or in the spring. And it basically serves the same purpose on what, we're, what we do with our migratory cover. Okay, uh, this is one of our employees. He was just dying to get into this tank of corn syrup. Um, it's very Im important uh, when, you're, uh, when you've got corn syrup, you put about 10% water in the, in the bottom of it and then you won't have this uh, problem with it all crystallizing on you. Uh, th this was a mistake that was made and uh, we ended up with a big mess to have to deal with. So he's in there cleaning it up and amongst all the, the bees that got in there and everything else. But uh, uh, he said it was quite, quite an enjoyable experience. <laughs> and uh, this, is, this is basically one month after getting to Georgia. This is the kind of brood that you have down there in, in December. So you can see when you have brood like this, uh, starting in December, it's not hard to go back, go from a winter cluster to a full-size hive by the end of January. Okay, we spend the rest of the winter building equipment, and uh, so we we'll get frames. We uh, tend to use plastic foundation, um, but we roll beeswax onto the plastic foundation. Uh, and up in Maine for years. Every, our honey flows are so poor that uh, people pretty much shied away from plastic foundation. And the same thing down, but, but down south we had such good honey flows we could use the plastic foundation as it came from the manufacturer with just, you know, a, a little coating of, of wax on it. And it would be successful in, when you had a really strong honey flow. But up in Maine, they did a very poor job. I don't know what your experiences are around here. But what we did find is that as long as you roll the beeswax on them, uh, we actually did a test. Of, we took 20 hives where we actually put three 
wax foundations on one, one half and three plastic foundations on the other half. And we found that in 18 out of 20, they actually drew out the plastic first. And uh, the, uh, as long as you rolled the beeswax on it. And uh, they, they went right to town on it. And uh, so this is what, one thing that we did last year is we had um, uh, the manufacturer triple coat the plastic foundation. So run it through their machine two more times to put a thicker coat of wax on. And we found that that, that actually worked very well. And a lot of main beekeepers per that purchased that were really happy with that, wanted us to get it again. That particular manufacturer um, refuses to do it this year because they're having trouble getting locating enough beeswax. But Date Ant will do it, but uh, that was uh, permadent, not permadent, uh, Pierco uh, wouldn't do anything more than the one coat this year. So anyways, we are getting Date Ant to do some for us. Um, but. Uh, if you have a source of beeswax and it's clean beeswax, that's the other thing you want to have. Um, we use our own cappings wax, and um, so you know we know we've got a pure source. Uh, we don't ever have any kind of miticide treatments on the hive when the honey's on. So we've got pretty very very clean beeswax that we're using. Uh, this is branding hive bodies. This is a, a dipping tank. Uh, we're actually boiling. Uh, our high bodies in paraffin, a combination of paraffin and microcrystalline wax. And when they come out of the, of the bath, they, it drives the moisture out, the wax takes its place, the microcrystalline wax hardens on the, at, near the surface so it keeps the paraffin from mi migrating back out of the wood. And when, uh, when you first take it out, you'll see the last bit of wax will suck right into the wood. And um, while it's still hot, we we'll put a coat of oil-based paint on it. And this is basically to take the place of down south of like a copper tox type of, uh, of dip, which was very popular for probably the last 30 years um, down in Florida and Georgia because our, our high bodies rot out so fast down there. High body is only good for about seven years with just a good coat of paint. I mean, then it'll just crumble in your hands. So you've got, so unless you want to replace a lot of equipment, you've got to do something to try and preserve it a little better. So a lot of people are going to um, wax dipping tanks. It's a little more dangerous uh, to deal with. And uh, one thing about employees is they always figure out ways of, uh, of uh, doing things even more dangerously. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, what would be the purpose of going in that lovely kitchen of ours if you could just cook it right in a, ba in a vat of wax? <laughs> I don't, I don't know, but uh, and here is one of, our, one of our guys painting high bodies. Okay, um, this, is, this is Tai Tai that's uh, blossoming here. It's kind of a cross between a bush and a tree. That's my dad underneath. It's all those, all those little white blossoms there. It's a really great buildup. Uh, in fact, that's why you see a lot of packages coming out of Georgia. A lot of it has to do with that Tai Tai flow. You have basically six weeks of, of nonstop honey flow. And, uh, and I've seen years where you could have you know, literally hundreds and hundreds of hives, put a whole deep of plastic foundation, draw out the whole, the whole thing, fill it full of honey, and cap it in two weeks' time. And uh, that's, that's pretty, it's, it can be pretty impressive. Last couple of years have not been very good down there because uh, everything has gotten, going, gotten started way too early and then we've had frost and it has killed off a lot of the blossoms. So we haven't had a, a very good flow for, well, last two years were not good. The year before was an okay flow. Uh, we're hoping this year with all this cold weather it's holding it off long enough and then we'll have more like a traditional year down there. Uh, here's, we, right when the Tai Tai starts, about the 1st of March, we start making nukes. And we'll make we're on roughly 1,000 nukes down there at least. And uh, you can see uh, in the background there, there's, there's a, a regular bee yard. We try not to put the nukes too close to the bee yard because um, the, uh, we don't want uh, all these queenless bees flying to the hives that have uh, you know, mated queens in them. And here's another yard, nuke yard of about another 100, 100 nukes. Uh, believe it or not, these queens can, even with little nuke boxes as close as those are together, 
I think in this yard we got 96 out of 100 took in this one. Uh, we usually run about 85%. Uh, one thing that's kind of interesting is that when we've had yards, though, like that last one of the plastic bee brief nukes, what we found is that if you have a lot of those close to one another, um, the bees do not orient well. Something about the ultraviolet light, uh, the reflection off that plastic, uh, they need something in order to orient. We found that if we intermix those plastic nukes with other nukes, but then we got just as good of, of acceptance. And, but if you have just a yard of plastic nukes, we found that that did not work well. And we did, we've done, oh, we've had those going now for probably 10 years. And uh, we've done, it took us a while to figure out why we were getting more like 65, 70% in the plastic bee brief nukes, where we were getting 85, 90% in the wooden nukes. And, uh, uh, once we started intermixing them, we were able to get a successful take with the plastic nukes, too. If, uh, if you have one or two by themselves, they're fine. Um, but um, if you have a large grouping of them, it seems to be a real problem with the queens orienting. Uh, this is just putting a queen cell in. Uh, we usually start up our nukes, like a lot of you would probably do, with two, a couple of frames of brood, a couple of frames of honey, and an empty frame. And with, within six weeks, six to eight weeks, this is a full-blown full nuke, re basically ready to transfer, ready to sell to somebody, and uh, it's, it's ready to roll. Uh, if we use, them with, use mated queens, we go at least a month. Um, we usually want anything in a box to be in that box for a month anyways before we sell it. If we're selling a queen, it's the same thing. A lot of problems with a lot of these queens that are coming from the south, especially out of Georgia, is that they're harvesting the queens way too early. And when they do that, uh, the pheromones, the queen's pheromones are not fully developed, and that queen is not going to be accepted well. And also you need to leave it in that mating nuke long enough to where you can evaluate it before you sell it. And a lot of times that isn't done because everybody's blowing and going first thing in the spring and everybody's trying to do sales and so forth. And a lot of times there's shortcuts that get, get taken. And uh, uh, so it's, it's important that when you're, where you're getting your queen that they are leaving them in those mating nukes long enough. Uh, we work a lot with David Mixa down in Florida. This is his finisher yard that he has down there. He does a lot uh, in the hundreds of thousands of queen cells a year. And he has a, a, a lot of different uh, breeder queens that he uses. I don't, probably some of you have gotten cells from him. Uh, you can actually order cells through the mail and, uh, and have them shipped up here. We actually get cells from him all summer. A lot of times we'll actually bring breeder queens down to him and he'll have our breeder queens and he'll actually make, make cells for us. Um, we, we do some queens on our own, but for the most part, we'll use him because he's dedicated to, to doing just that job. And we usually have more than enough work to do. Uh, depends on when we've had a number of young people that have worked for us, and some of them will take that on as a project, and we'll lose that person off to college. And, and uh, so we, we pretty much work with David, David every year. We have had a number of young people that have been, we've, uh, I like working with the young people and uh, uh, that have been very successful working with us. I think out of, out of the last four, we have two now at Cornell and one at MIT. And, uh, and a lot of the reason they got in was the work that they've done in, in, our, in our bee business. So it, it's, uh, it's, been, it's been good for everybody. Um, okay, also at this time of year, obviously we're dealing with a lot of swarms. Uh, the, uh, now that's a pretty good sized swarm right there. <laughs> And uh, when, when, you, when you fill two high bodies and you, got a, and, you, and you need a third one to put the swarm in, that's a pretty big swarm. So, so a lot of times what happens is uh, you'll get near these bee yards and you'll have secondary tertiary swarms with, um, and tertiary swarms that have virgin queens and they'll join up with the one with a, with a swarm that already, already took place. So you know, each day some of these swarms get larger and larger and larger. And uh, the... Uh, and so we try to, we, uh, here's, here's one that didn't get very far. And uh, see, this was pretty remarkable. I mean, this is as much as a five frame nuke in terms of number of bees that were in there. And it was one very large sheet of wax. Didn't even have two, it didn't even have uh, 
two frames. It just made one gigantic frame that went across all, all, all basically all four, four hives, right in between them. So we, we cut that into pieces, strung, strung it into, inside a hive body, and dumped all the bees in and, and uh, got it onto conventional, uh, conventional frames. And sometimes you just can't, you can't bear to see those, those swarms just take off on you, you know? <laughs> and uh, so you do ridiculous things to catch them. And the, uh, this is a, a much safer way of doing it. Uh, this is, we kind of came up with this a few years ago. We have truck boards that we put on top of the trucks, and that's what you're seeing leaning up against the side of a tree there. And we just put a couple of uh, uh, brackets, brackets on it, and uh, we use one of those inner covers that we have, which is right there. We turn it inverted upside down and, and put a hide body on top of that. We just screw four pieces to it. And then when we, uh, we'll put some pheromone in there or lemon pledge uh, to attract them, and we'll set one of these up at each of the bee yards. And then when you catch your swarm, th that, this will put it eight to 10 feet in the air. And when you catch the swarm, what we do is we unhook this strap here, and the bottom strap acts like a hinge, and you can walk this thing right down the right down to the ground, and unhook. And then you unscrew your high body, take it take it away, put it on a uh, put it on a pallet, and put a new one on, and do the thing all over again. But you can just w basically just walk this right right down to the ground, and uh, it works pretty effectively without having to bring ladders out and so forth. Oh, I would say probably uh, we get uh, uh, close to two or three swarms um, in each box during the, during the season. The, uh, but there's a lot of swarms going. So, uh, you know, if we have a yard with 48 hives on Tai Tai, I've seen years where I would guess almost every single hive swarms at, at some point. The, uh, so, and we're not catching a lot of them, but you know, if you catch two or three in every yard and you've got 20 or 30 yards, you know, that's, that's quite a number of hives. That, that, uh, that, uh, meanwhile, while those are swarming down there, the ones up north, uh, we're actually putting candy on them. Uh, late January to early February, when we have a day where the bees are actually out flying, we'll put uh, a candy board on, or on everything as an insurance policy and also to stim stimulate the queens and get, get things rolling. Th this is uh, that inner cover I showed you earlier, and this is candy. We basically used it as a, as a candy mold, and we just invert it over the hive. Yeah, you can see the insul insulation in here. I'll talk a little bit about some of our wintering system afterwards. Uh, this is uh, this is basically four hives on a uh, a regular pallet, regular bee pallet. And what we've done is we actually space our our clips a little wider, and in that way we can actually put a styrofoam hive body for the second hive body up. And uh, what we found is that if we insulate this, the, the uppermost hive body, it does help like the smaller, the, your smaller clusters become big clusters, okay? The real small clusters, it'll help get them through the winter that where they might not have otherwise. The, the medium-sized clusters will become big clusters. The ones that were big clusters probably didn't need any insulation at all, okay? But uh, across the board with ins insulating the top high body, it gives it a warmer, cozier environment and it allows the bees to access the food stores that are in there and uh, basically keep things w warmer so that they can expand their uh, brood nest that much faster. Uh, this is the candy board inverted there, and then on top of that we have an absorption board like Homosote. This is a Canadian version of it that we're using. Uh, it's, it doesn't have any chemicals in it, it's just starch and wood fiber. But uh, I know a lot of beekeepers in Maine use Homosote uh, successfully too. I'm not sure if you guys are worrying as much about the moisture down here or not. Um, do you guys use Homosote or an absorption board on top of your hives down here? No, they, we find that's pretty pretty critical to wintering. You might find this winter you're going to find some problems down here with uh, with moisture. 
um, if, if you don't deal, don't deal with it. Because when it gets really cold and you've got all that moisture coming from those hives, it gets up underneath your cover and it freezes. And then it rains down on your bees when it, war when it gets warm. So um, if you've got a way of absorbing it or having it expel out through the, through the top of the hive, it's, it's pretty important. I mean, we don't see, by using this system, we don't see any mold anymore. We don't see any ex excess moisture. We aren't killing any bees due to moisture. But in the far north, it's really important. Yes? Yeah, what the foam will do is uh, we're actually doing putting the insul insulation on top of this in, a, in addition, like in within the cover itself. What the foam will do will tend to make keep the air warmer till air can be expelled, so that you don't have as much of a moisture problem. So you, sometimes the foam kind of takes the place of having the the, the moisture board because um, because it ke keeps it warm enough up there where you don't have a lot of stuff. You don't have uh, your excess moisture actually freezing to where it will melt back down. But you can see, I mean, this is, these are pretty good sized clusters. This is late January up, up in Maine. So, uh, you know, they're, they're coming right along. Uh, in uh, March, we do similar to what you have down here. We have bee schools. Um, uh, we have 30 or 40 in our beginner bee school, 20 to 30 in an advanced bee school at, at our place every year. Uh, different chapters will, will sponsor bee schools throughout the state and uh, you know, we have a pretty active organization up in Maine like, like you guys do. Um, the, uh, I, I usually find that working with all these, these beekeepers um, that are hobbyists up there, they're, the beekeepers kind of fall in one of three categories. They're either hippies, yuppies, or old farts. <laughs> and uh, so you probably look around the room and we can sort, sort you all out down here too. It's probably pretty similar. Um, no, we might have a few more hippies up there. I don't know. But, uh, uh, you know, and what I usually find is the, the, the hippies will, they are always amazed at everything I say. The, the yuppies, they question everything I say, and the old farts argue with everything that I say. <laughs> so, so, so usually all I have to do is tell them that, and it shuts up a few of the old farts. Because <laughs> they don't want to think of themselves that way. So. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the rest of the forage is getting going down in Georgia. This is kind of like the understory. This is gallberry that you see, and you actually can see some. Uh, this is uh, saw palmetto, and this is gallberry here. We have actually have a high bush and a low bush gallberry, and those come on after the tie tie. Uh, we around the first part of May, we go around and we gather all the bees up so that we can put them on trucks. Stick them on top of corn syrup and dump them <laughs> on the highway. The, uh, the nukes are ready to go at this point. So the nukes that we're selling, they're beautiful and they're, they're ready to go. They need to go out the door. Um, and this is a five frame nuke that you see right here. And uh, it's, you can see it's had a good honey flow and it's, it's, it's ready to go. Uh, what we usually find up in Maine is that our nukes are, because we start them early, they're really on the exponential uh, growth curve by the time our beekeepers get them. Sometimes when you start a nuke, if you just start it, put a, a mated queen in it, and then sell it, it's got a ways to go before it's really at that point where it's going to exponentially increase in population. And, uh, uh, we actually have a lot of people that purchase our nukes that will, uh, they pretty much always get at least one box of honey off our nukes in the first year. And we'll have some people make as much as 100 to 125 pounds off, off a nuke first year, which I'm always amazed at because if I get a 50 pound average off all my full size hives up in Maine, I'm, I'm very happy. Uh, you know, we do a lot of pollination, so that cuts into our honey crop some, but I'm still, it's a good year for us if we get 50 pound average up there. Here's a load of bees on a bee truck. I, I just got back from Georgia. We just got done sending three of these to, to almonds. Um, uh, only one of them was, was my bees, but uh, the other guys that are working in the, 
in the same bee camp that uh, they kind of sublease from me and uh, the uh, one of the guys says I'm kind of like the dictator of the of the area and uh, and they have to do what I say or they're gone so uh, it's uh, uh, meanwhile, this is a hive up here in Maine, so this is 1st of May, and this is one that we've wintered over. We're, we're kind of working on an easier system for wintering nukes, uh, so once you have the equipment, you don't have to make a lot of stuff yourself, for, so the hobbyists can get a little more self-sufficient. And this is, a, this is just a double deep hive, and this is two four frame nukes on top of one another. In each one there's four, it's a double four. So what we do is we put a four frame nuke in the bottom and we'll put four frames of honey above it and go into the winter that way. And uh, because you're keeping things warm and the upper hive gets the heat from down below, um, by first of May you should have a, a hive ready to go, all eight frames that are uh, r rolling by the first of May. And we find that with this system, the four frame nukes we put in will usually have more bees and be in better shape than a lot of the bees that people winter, like full size hives that they end up wintering. And uh, th this is kind of like we have two, uh, I've actually brought um, a lot of these things I'm talking about up here so you can kind of look at them. Uh, th this is the configuration that you're seeing right there. Okay. The, uh, and these are inner covers over each of the four frame nukes. We have a way for the, the bottom hive moisture to vent out through the entire system. See that channel right there? Basically the moisture from each of these nukes can be exhaled through there and that hole right there actually goes right down to the bottom hive and so its moisture can exhale out through. And, uh, and then we put an absorption board on top of this. And basically, it keeps the, the screen keeps the bees in on each of these nukes. They have their own own entrance on each side, and and you can see that that I mean that's that's first of May. So that's uh, you've got a hive down below that's that's a full size hive ready to split, and you've got two four frame nukes that are now eight frame nukes that can be transferred and. You can, and they're 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 ready to roll for the next next year. So th this uh, this system has been very successful, um, and we have a we kind of do it with wooden nukes with four framers. I can show you show that up here too if anybody's interested during the break. Uh, we maintain like queen banks where we always have a lot of mating nukes going. We maintain queen banks uh, and, and then we'll purchase a number of queens if we're running out, especially early in the season up in Maine. Sometimes we have a lot of people want queens the first of May and we're not really all set up and going because we've been putting bees out on pollination and everything. So we'll actually purchase a bunch of queens, put them in a queen bank uh, so that we've got a source of, of queens for people that want to do splits. Okay, meanwhile, meanwhile oops, um, they're just showing a queen in a queen cage. Uh, we, to bring the bees up, they go out on blueberry pollination, apple pollination. Uh, we go to wild raspberries up where there's been forestry operations after the blueberries are done. Uh, a lot of our bees will go up there where they've done huge forestry operations. And uh, the, uh, the rat wild raspberries are the first thing that comes up. And uh, sometimes we can make a uh, 70 pound average on raspberries. But the problem is it doesn't happen every time. So you, you, you'll, you'll go, you could go two or three years in a row and make a 10 to 20 pound average, which is hardly worth all of the extra effort that goes into it. And then all of a sudden you'll get a year where, like this year we probably did close to a 100 pound average on raspberries. And then it's like, you, you feel like it was worthwhile then. Okay, uh, meanwhile, we're, after we've done all the pollination, we've got the bees out on their summer locations. We've checked them, make sure they're queen right and ready to go for the rest of the season. Uh, we monitor mites all the time. A lot of times we'll do a mite treatment in there. And then uh, uh, we're trying to raise our blueberry crop. And then in August, uh, this is the blueberry harvest. It's my son there and he, he's one of the ones over at Cornell now. And uh, we're 
we, we usually um, harvest somewhere in the neighborhood of oh, 200 to 500,000 pounds a year, depending on the year. And uh, we're, we, we're still all, uh, we do all of our harvesting by hand still, so usually we'll have seven, 50 to 70 people. It usually takes about 30, but a lot of people change their mind after they get out there and start doing this backbreaking work. And, and um, you know, they, have their, they get their beer money and decide they, that's enough for today and things like that. It's a typical migratory crew. Uh, we have um, some people that really stick with it and make really good money, and then we have other people that are kind of on vacation out there, I guess. Uh, meanwhile, while we're raking in blueberries, the bears up in Arusta County are raking in our bees. And uh, this was, uh, I think we lost something like 17 hives in this yard. Uh, so it didn't take long for me to decide to buy the most expensive fence chargers I could find that packed the most wallop. And in the last two years, we haven't lost a single, single hive. Uh, um, up in Aroostook County. Uh, so these new fence chargers we have, they're solar powered and they're, they're super duper. I mean, we, we put about $500 into each installation, but it's, it's well worth it because uh, we, there's a lot of bears up in Maine and uh, uh, you know, blueberries we have to deal with them and then in Aroostook County we have to deal with them and on the raspberries we have to deal with them. So everywhere we go we've got to put electric fences around. But uh, if you do everything right, then you know you can get some pretty good honey crops at times. This, these are, uh, this is Charlie. He's he's showing me. Uh, he's kind of an old old school beekeeper. That's pretty much how he goes, regardless if he's loading bees or anything. That's all he wears. You can see that Charlie was the one that loaded up the corn syrup, but uh, <laughs> but uh, he. Caution is not his middle, middle name, put it that way. Uh, but uh, these are some of my hives here. And you see this is a pretty good honey crop. One, two, three, four, five mediums solid full. He's showing you the top frame coming out of there. In fact, they've already started filling up the, uh, the, the cover with burr comb because they needed another super. So that's, that's a pretty good crop of honey right there. I mean, you look at... Uh, Three out of those four hives, it's got in excess of 200 pounds a piece on it. And uh, the problem is, you know, we, this is the kind that we show in pictures, but we also have a lot of yards with not much on them. <laughs> and, uh, and you're always chasing, chasing that elusive honey flow around. Some years one place will be good, another year another place will be better, and, and so forth. It's never consistent across the board. This is, this is a little bit more typical yard where you're getting one or two supers of honey. Here we are harvesting honey in a yard up there and uh, we put them on pallets and then pick them up with a forklift and put them on trucks. And then we bring them to our extracting facility in Albion and uh, this is our, this is our, our, our uncapper. We've got a couple of radi radials and a, and a horizontal extractor over the line here. Back in here, we have a, a wax spinner where the, the honey gets, the whole slurry ends up actually going through a heat exchanger in, up here into, into the wax spinner. And then pure honey comes up and actually ends up in this tank up here. And then we can go from that tank right into drums. So pretty typical commercial type operation. This is also where we do our bee school in here. We, we have stuff out. These are supers waiting to be extracted and these are ones that are already done over here. And uh, then from there we store the honey and drums and then over the course of the winter we, uh, well, let's see, the, there's a wax spinner. The, uh, those are just wa dry wax cappings that we melt down and, and uh, for, to make beeswax. And then this is our honey packing room that we have. And uh, that doesn't show everything, but we have, we have multiple tanks here and we have the ability to go through different types of filtration. We can uh, go through a filter press if we need long shelf life for like a grocery store type product. Uh, we have filter socks that we can use uh, if we don't want to heat, it, heat as much and not filter it as, as fine a, a micron. 
or we uh, actually have uh, on this side we have a sock that's actually a strainer instead and we can do a raw honey product where we actually uh, will seed, seed the honey and uh, bottle it directly out of the tanks. That's what you're seeing here with this bottler here is uh, bottling a honey. This, this is a, a, our product that's a raw honey. It's a creamed honey. Okay, we actually cream our raw honey and, uh, uh, and we find most of the consumer now thinks raw honey is creamed honey. Okay, they, and uh, in the state of Maine, that's pretty much what everybody's perception is, is what, if, if it doesn't look creamed because that's how we sell it, um, they figure it must not be raw. <laughs> but, uh, and then we, hit, we do a couple of big fairs and uh, we find that some fairs are very good. If there's a, if there's a honey crowd there, it, it can be very good. Uh, and some fairs are not so good. Some, most, some of the fairs you have to educate the whole time and, and uh, you'll be lucky to make $10 an hour doing, for all your, all your efforts. And then uh, this is a common ground fair that I'm showing here. And we will sell somewhere around 5,000 pounds of honey at this fair in, in three days. And so that's very good. And because you're selling 5,000 pounds at retail, is, uh, compared to what we normally sell as wholesale, we can actually make more in one weekend there than, than two or three months. Uh, okay, uh, what, uh, this, this whole issue of CCD is actually kind of, kind of come full circle. This is kind of where we thought this was when it first started. I was actually at the first meeting in, in Washington um, about the whole CCD issue. The Blueberry Commission sent me down and uh, I was the first person that was asked to speak at, the, at that meeting. And this is what I said it was at the time, it was a multiple stress syndrome. And this was kind of the, at the time when everybody thought it was some mysterious new thing that was causing, causing the problem. And now everybody's kind of come around to thinking that it is a multiple stress thing. And for different people, um, a colony collapse disorder, so to speak, is could be a different thing, it could be the thing that broke the camel's back for different operations. And what we, what we find is that if we take our bees and do only one pollination per hive and make honey, we don't have many losses other than normal queen losses that, that we would normally have. Um, once we start trying to do more with a hive where we try and do two or three pollinations, we're going to have a lot of dead bees. Um, and, and it's for a number of reasons. Um, the uh, uh, nutrition is a huge one. Uh, nutrition and varroa mites, I think, are, the, are probably the two biggest ones. Now, we have other, there's lots of other issues. You, the Bee Journal is full of them every month. Um, you, different universities will come out and say, uh, we found what CCD is. And then another one will come out and say, we found what CCD is. And, you know, and usually whatever they find is the reason. That's usually whatever expertise that particular university has and what kind of funding that they're, they're getting. Um, and, and that is true, I mean, because they want to attract more funding. So if they think they've solved a piece of the puzzle, they, I mean, there's a lot of marketing involved there, you know. Um, I know our state bee inspector has, uh, uh, he's coined the CCD as cash cow disorder. Uh, um, and he's a Jersey guy. Exactly. He's, uh, uh, he, he's a Jersey man. The, uh, it's uh, Tony Jadzik. He uh, is an excellent bee inspector. The, uh, we, we worked pretty closely with him. A lot of the stuff that we're doing, he'll actually spend like days actually doing like mite rolls. So he, he saves me a lot of time because he'll do a lot of that kind of work for us because you know, he's trying to learn too. And so, and we'll pretty much sacrifice big areas of our operation. Say, okay, we're going to do this particular type of treatment. And he'll, he'll um, do roll after roll after roll. Uh, we did a pretty extensive uh, Apivar treatment this year. Uh, we did Apigard early on for mites. Uh, did, it wasn't hot enough, and we didn't have very good success in the fall. Um, we had done some Apivar earlier in the year without really very impressive results. Um, there was brood present in the hive when we did it. And we were still, 42 days later, re getting fives and sixes, okay? Um, and we weren't, weren't that impressed. Um, you know, I, and I kind of attributed it at the time 
to the fact that uh, most commercial operations in the United States have there be the mites have been subject to amitraz for a significant period of time and where that's the active ingredient in apivar uh, was a concern that there was some resistance that had built up <laughs> however when we used the same product the, that strip it's a con, you know a contact pesticide uh, we used it with the bees in winter cluster it worked remarkably well um, we had uh, we had hives that double deeps cluster in both boxes, really, really super um, big, large populations with just one strip. After one day, the counts went from 30 down to three and four in one day's time with one strip. And uh, it, with, after, a, after a week to two weeks, we were getting zeros and ones on almost everything. So we were very impressed. The, the, the product worked very well. We've actually been trying to stay off of any kind, of, because of my concern about basically the mites developing resistance, we've been going primarily with oxalic acid and formic acid the last couple of years, just organic acids. And uh, this is the first time we've kind of gone back to to using it other, other than on these test cases. Um, we, we actually did uh, Apivar across the board. We did do HopGuard a couple of years ago, had some problems with HopGuard when they were in the winter cluster. We actually killed a lot of bees. Um, we had um, as many as a quart of dead bees in front of some hives uh, with HopGuard, but that's in winter cluster. As long as when you're putting them in, the bees can get away from the product, at least for a little while, no problem at all. But, but uh, we talked to the manufacturer because they said, oh, that shouldn't happen. It only happened one time before that they knew about. And it was in Germany. And it was because the, the beekeeper that did it must have left the covers off the hive when it was snowing. And, and uh, I said, was that the only time you've ever tested this product in a winter cluster? And they said, yeah, I think it is. And I said, well, here, here's two tests now. And, uh, the, uh, and basically the same thing happened. You know, every, every third hive or so, there'd be quite a pile of dead bees in the front. So we, did, we, did, uh, we didn't lose any hives from it, but it was, pretty, it was significant enough to where uh, it won't be something I would repeat again is using hop guard in a, in a winter cluster. OK. Um, you see, all of these things are kind of interrelated. Um, the, uh, you know, depending on nutrition, that's going to impact the immune system. Um, how are the bees going to react to the viruses from having a higher mite load? Um, you know, it's, it's what makes a lot of studying about bees and a lot of these individual things very difficult because one hive that has excellent nutrition could react totally different and actually be able to handle, let's say, a pesticide load than another hive that's where their immune system is compromised. Okay, uh, com commercial beekeeping. Uh, I kind of alluded to some of this stuff. Really, a lot of what's driving a lot of these problems with this colony collapse disorder is, is economics. Um, it's a lot easier to keep your bees alive and not have all of these other problems where you're losing a lot of bees if you don't have to chase a pollination check. The whole industry has changed now to where we're all ch chasing pollination checks because the only thing that's guaranteed is the only thing that's up high enough price-wise to make ends meet. But sometimes that can uh, be a self-defeating um, process because you end up losing more bees from it. But I don't think this, this whole thing has, has been talked about enough, but th that is really what's driving it. Used to be a lot of beekeepers in this country didn't do as much pollination and just went after honey. And if you're going after honey, you don't put the bees under the same stresses that you do by uh, going off and doing pollination. Okay, uh, pay, pay attention to nutrition. A good honey flow will cover up a lot of bad beekeeping. Okay. Even, good, even people that don't know what they're doing, bees do pretty darn good if there's a great honey flow going. And uh, they make, it, make you look like an awfully good beekeeper. Okay, um, whoops. Um, uh, even, uh, and you wanna make sure that they've got good nutrition going into the fall especially, because you wanna have good, win good bees going into the winter. Uh, stay ahead of the mites. This is very critical. You probably heard this many times, but I can't uh, 
reiterate that enough because that's uh, most of the bees in Maine die from varroa mites. I mean, sure, there's a little bit here, there of all these other little things that, that can get bees. But the vast majority of them, if people took care of their varroa mites, uh, there'd be a lot more live colonies come spring. Uh, we do a lot of, we've been doing a lot of oxalic acid on our nukes, and that, we've had really good success with that. What we're doing is on day 18, after we put a cell in, we'll go back in and actually um, do a treatment. Uh, Randy Oliver has a good uh, formula on his website on that. And, uh, uh, that's been very successful. We did about a thousand nukes last year and started them off really, really clean just by using oxalic acid. Yes? Lincoln, are you doing a trickling oxalic acid? Yes. Treatment? Yes, it's trickling. We actually used a, a sprayer. We're actually trying to get hold of a, an air actuated um, uh, drench gun is what we're, what we're, what we're working on. Uh, just so you, because the only problem with using a sprayer is you kind of have two variables. One, how hard someone holds the sprayer and the, the second one is how fast they move the sprayer. And uh, you know, I feel like I can do a pretty good job myself, but if I have to rely on other people, I'd rather have it a little more measured out like you can with a drench gun. You can say, okay, we do, I'm going to do five mils per seam kind of a thing. Um, Drone brood, uh, you know, minimize your drone brood. Um, you know, a drone, a mite, a female mite going into a worker cell comes out with 1.3 mites. One going into a drone cell comes out with an average of 2.6 mites. So you can see how quickly you can exponentially increase if you have a lot of drone brood in, in your hive. Okay, so drone trapping can take care of that because you, you trap them out. But um, if, you, if your comb is all drony, and you're, you're getting a lot of drone brood in there, you're just gonna, you're gonna raise mites that much faster. So, not exactly a plug for top bar hive people, but, uh, but that is a problem uh, with top bar hives when you're letting bees raise their own comb. I know there's people that subscribe to that thought, but uh, mites are a major problem because, because they're, the bees will naturally try to put in 17% um, drone brood in that hive if you let them, let them make it themselves. So if you supply them with a lot of nice plastic foundation where they're starting off with worker cells, it takes a while for them to get to that, that 17%. Okay, uh, pesticide exposure, I know that like neonicotinoids are a big issue out there. Um, you know, just know what people are, are doing around you. You know, are they placing, are they putting pesticides on something that your bees go after. Uh, neonicotinoids are used up near us where we have uh, bees on potatoes, but the potatoes don't have any nectar and the bees do not visit them and our bees come out of there very healthy year after year. And, and that's the, the largest area in the state where neonicotinoids are being used. So those are not affecting us as, as beekeepers that much because of the type of plant they're being used on right now. Okay. Um, the, uh, now, in another area of the state, might be something different, but that's in the state of Maine, that's where most of the neonics are being used right now. So, uh, replace comb regularly. A lot of, I've seen this many, many times where old comb, you can end up with um, uh, a lot of skips on your brood because you got old comb because there's lots of that wax as a depository for a lot of pesticides, both ones beekeepers put in hives and ones that come from outside. It's like the liver of the hive. Yes? Question for you. Um, a couple of years ago, I, I believe there was a uh, statement about replacing comb. And so I started putting the year that I put that comb in there, putting it right on the top. Is it five years? Is the uh, you know, it, it, it kind of depends upon what you're using for your treatments, okay? Um, the, the question was, should you go like five years for your comb? We do the same thing. We actually color code our, our, our combs. Um, like on the top bar, we'll like go red one year, blue another year. Mostly we do that because then the hobbyists that buy it, they, don't, they can't look at it and go, oh wow, look how, what year that was, <laughs> you know? So they don't know what my colors mean, so, uh, but that's uh, the... Uh, yeah, but uh, most of our comb now we're selling because we sell so many nukes is actually is actually pretty new. But um, but a lot of beekeepers that's the reason they sell nukes is to get their old comb out of the out of the hive. So it's something to remember when you get a nuke. 
um, over the course of the winter, get those old frames to the outside of the bottom box. In the spring when you go to reverse, those frames will be empty. Get them out of your hive and put new frames in. Also a good practice for fowl brood potential. If you're buying nukes from somebody, a lot of these commercial beekeepers are putting Thailand on their hives every year. They're covering up potential fowl brood spores. Okay. Once it, Now a lot of you don't want to put antibiotics in your hives. If you're not covering up those same spores, those spores are going to, going to come to life in your hive after, after that old Thailand has worn off. Okay, one way to, to combat that is to get those combs out of your hive. All right, so get rid of those old combs. That's why I tell all the, the people up in Maine that are, are buying nukes, you know. That way you can have all clean combs and you're not going to have that reinfestation, um, you know, from, from those old combs that, you know, because people will buy them and say, oh wow, these are nice and clean and the brood looks beautiful and everything. Well, you can still have those spores there for 50 years. So um, hopefully you're not buying any comb that's 50 years old, but, but, uh, but I mean, it can be just uh, several years old and have uh, fowl brood spores in it. So uh, all our comb, we actually have it irradiated. Uh, so anything, any hives that die on ours, we actually go through the comb, we ship it down to Florida. I know you have a facility here in New Jersey. We ship it down to Florida, it goes through there, the truck driver waits and brings it up to us in Georgia. So that way we know we're starting with clean comb every, every single year. Even though we don't have a foul brood problem, I don't want to have a problem. And, uh, and if there's any viral, viral particles and stuff like that, it d eliminates that too. Uh, how many time wise? About 10 minutes, okay, good. All right, uh, queens, uh, uh, we try to have young, prolific queens. Um, I know when uh, we try to go with genetic diversity, uh, we definitely go with re reputable queen breeders. Okay, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of hype in the press about all these local queens and all this kind of stuff. Well, I'll tell you, uh, I would rather have a queen from someone that's a reputable queen breeder that's doing the job right and is actually buying breeder queens and that are proven breeder queens that, uh, you know, I mean, these breeder queens come from all over the country and all over the world. Um, I mean, uh, David Mixa down there in Florida, the one that we're using, I mean, he's, he actually spends about $10,000 a year just on breeder queens. Okay, so we, you can bring in genetics from everywhere. It isn't just from someone's backyard. It, it, to me, it's a little bit ludicrous to think that somebody in their backyard that's had two hives and they're raising queens is going to have a better queen because it came from their backyard than the Ontario Queen Breeders Association up there that spent $300,000 or $400,000 on their program to genetically come up with a better queen. Okay, um, I mean, not that I'm saying it's bad to be doing this kind of stuff. I think it's great, but it's really important to actually do things right in terms of nutrition for the queens uh, and having your queens fully developed, basically having a selection process to make sure that you've got a good queen. You know, so it's, it's more, more important to have good queen breeding practices than it is local stock and, and marketing hype. I mean, that being said, if I'm up in Maine and I, I'll, I'll take a queen from a really good hive have, and bring it down to Mixa and actually use that as my queen rearing stock um, because this marketing hype works. You know, people say, oh, I want that queen that was in your backyard. And I say, okay, there, there's the, the offspring. Not that, you know, that the ones that I'm selecting, I'm, I'm selecting them out of a, a large population of bees. So I am selecting really good ones. But, uh, um, but are they any better than the one that I got from Mixa? Not really. You know, the ones that I got from him from the Ontario Queen Breeders Association. Uh, you know, some of these things have had thousands of years of genetics in them, not just a couple of years. I probably offend, offended somebody with that whole thing there. But. <laughs> okay, uh, requeening with nukes. We always requeen with nukes. Okay, we maintain several hundred mating nukes, and if you have laying workers, you just pop a pop a nuke in there. Okay, don't worry about changing them out and 
putting a hive with a good queen in the place of where they were or taking them out and shaking them in bushes and all, all these different methods. Uh, it, just put a queen that's, uh, put a nuke in there that's queen right and they'll toe the line and off, you'll be off and running. Okay, most commercial beekeepers do it this way. And, uh, and it's a lot easier and your success rate for, re for introducing a new queen is about 100%. Okay, so we get cells sent in overnight. Uh, you can see we, we usually have genetic lines, probably 10 different genetic lines every year that we start with. We'll narrow it down to four or five because we might see some we don't like the brood pattern as well and stuff like that. We've got a whole list of, of them here. We, we try to incorporate some of these positive traits like VSH traits. Uh, Minnesota hygienics, um, these traits that, like the Ontario Buckfast, from the Ontario Queen Breeders Association. We have some of our own ru stock that actually came from Russian descent that we've, that we've incorporated into our line. And uh, so basically we're looking at new stuff every year um, and, and, uh, and trying to keep up that genetic diversity. Here's a... Uh, Here's actually a mating nuke. This is a three-part three one that we're putting cells in here. Uh, one thing that's on our mating nukes, we've, got, we've gone to kind of these four framers and with a feeder in the middle. And this is just a man lake feeder that's in the middle here, like a plastic one. And it, this works very well. Uh, we've, put, we've actually made a board to go on top of this that's slotted on the bottom. And you can, you can just put a divider in a box on each side and then have this little board in the middle and then one, these bees can feed out of one side and these bees feed out of the other and they don't co-mix. Co it's sort of like uh, the things that like Mike Palmer and, and uh, Kirk uh, Webster, they kind of make their own out of, out of these Luan type of things. Uh, very time consuming. You can do the exact same thing with a man light feeder with a couple of boards. Uh, and it's, it's very effective. In fact, I, I know those guys saw what we were doing and I think they're going to go to some similar type of system. But this is basically all it takes. A little board like that that's grooved on the two sides and then it's grooved for the two holes and then uh, you have a divider board that's got, little, uh, that's got a little hole cut out of it on this side for this hive and this side for the other hive. So when the bees come in through here and come in that slot, they'll end up, they can't get over to this hive and vice versa. And then we have a hole in the middle that we can actually fill, fill the feeder from the top without even going into the hive. So that's that hole in the middle. We put a plug in that. Okay, anybody's interested, come up and take a look uh, at what we're doing there. You can make, make them really easily. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if um, Man Lake was looking at uh, commercializing this, it be in the catalog. But uh, take a look, it's really easy to make and it works, works really well. We have hundreds of them. Okay, um, yeah, here's a traditional way of uh, requeening with a nuke. You put a piece of newspaper in between, cut a few slits in it, and then uh, then, then pop your uh, nuke in the top. And you can see that uh, here's a nuke put in the top and here's a month later, basically both boxes are full of bees. Okay, um, the, uh, and so this is how we typically will requeen. Uh, sometimes we we'll just spray with honey bee healthy and, and some sugar syrup on the bees down below so that they will actually co-mingle without having to use the newspaper. That's another, another way of doing it. We do the same thing when we're introducing virgin queens very, very successfully. Okay, now one thing that one of the girls that worked for me, um, I got her working on this project. Um, how could we efficiently do this same kind of process without all of the putting frames in, taking frames out, and so forth. And this is uh, something we've been working on, and uh, we've sold a lot of them to uh, hobbyists in Maine. And it's, a, uh, it's like a little nuke, and this actually sits inside of your nuke box and will actually sit right down inside your hive. And so what we do is we raise the, raise the, the we put 
we'll actually make the nuke in here, put the queen cell in here, and then when it's ready, we can actually make some slits in the side of, of this cardboard and just pop it in a hive. So we don't take things out, we don't worry about losing a queen, somebody um, screwing up when they're transferring frames and so forth, and the hive is off and running. And this is a pretty exciting project to me. We're actually doing this more and more. We, a lot of hobbyists will purchase one of these. And, you know, if, if 1st of August, if you don't have any brood in your hive or you've got laying workers, you're pretty much done for the season. Unless, you know, you can't just put a queen in there because, you know, 21 days later, the first eggs hatch out. You've got no population to go through winter. But if you pop something like this in here with three frames of brood with a queen that's established, you can get your hive reestablished and off and going. So a lot of, a lot of hobbyists have, have opted to purchase these from us, in, in, you know, especially when they get into August. And it works great. Uh, and your acceptance rate's 100%. And, uh, okay, there is a picture of one. This was an earlier version of the cardboard. It popped in into a hive and this was af afterwards and it's all established and what we find is that the the bees will eat out that cardboard and, the, and it won't impede the, the queen at all. She'll fill that right back full of brood again and keep walk, march back into the the box and keep right on a going so you know eventually we get them get them back out of the hive and re reuse them. But we kind of trying to come up with some system to requeen and do splits fast like we're coming up for pollination and uh, or we don't have a lot of moving and moving moving. We, we want to just pop something out, pop it into a hive and, and go. And these are some studies that she did on different types of cardboard and how quickly the bees chewed the cardboard out. Um, but anyways, you know, come on up and take a look at it. Anybody's got any questions? I'm glad to show you anything there. Um, other pests and pathogens. This we're having to deal with all of these things. Um, and these, uh, well, at our business, we're basically study, always studying these different stressors and try to reduce as many of these stressors as we can and still try to survive economically. Um, and, uh, and then these are a number of these different innovations that we talked about, the swan board fat inner cover, the corrugated plastic vent nukes. We've got some of those nukes over here that we've been using for sales. They're, they're, they work really well. They're more solid like a wooden nuke box. Uh, migratory mating nukes. This is a three-frame requeening nuke. And uh, oh, then my daughter's uh, hive stand. I, I, if I don't tell you about that, she'll kill me. Um, my daughter's 16, and she's just really getting into the business right now and help, helping out. Um, she worked, came up with this hive stand, and it. Uh, and uh, Janet's got copies of the of, of this. If anybody's interested in making their own, uh, a lot of people in Maine have gotten copies, and they're making them themselves for uh, backyard. The thing that's nice about this hive stand is if you have trouble lifting your top hive body, you can actually just it. The bottom part lines up with this top deck, and. Here's, here, she's showing an example over here. And uh, so you, can, you just tilt, tilt it up when you're trying to get at your other box. Instead of lifting it, it's right at the right level. And uh, it's, you know, you can do the same thing by putting like some cinder blocks or something behind it. It's not unlike what we do as commercial beekeepers when we're working bees like on a pallet. Um, but uh, in the past, most hive stands that are out there, they're just for the hive itself. There's, nobody's really thinking about, you know, the, the uh, ergonomics. And you hook your uh, smoker on the end, and there's a magnet to hold your hive tool. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought she did a really good job on that. But the uh, this is my daughter. She's she's demonstrating it right there. And yeah, you can see the hive tool on the magnet there. But this little lip here will actually hold that fat inner cover so you can actually w set this, slide this over on it and, and work your upper high body and your lower high body at the same time and that lip will keep it from sliding off the hive and that lip will also work as, a, as the hanger for your, for your smoker. And that's it.